Hello, everyone. Hello, welcome to Women and Children First, the virtual edition. Um, I'm Sarah Hollenbeck. I'm the co-owner of Women and Children First. We are one of the last feminist bookstores in the United States. And we're honored to host tonight's discussion featuring Diane Wilson in conversation with Carolyn Holbrook for Diane's new incredible book, The Seed Cooper. This book is such a gift, and I'm so glad that you both are here to talk about your relationship as writers, as well as this just miraculous book. We begin our virtual event as we begin our events held in the storm with a land acknowledgement. So please join me in acknowledging that the land on which our bookstore stands is the unceded territory of the Peoria the Potawatomi, the Miami, and the Sioux people. There are over 75,000 indigenous people of many nations living in Illinois, and our bookstore strives to rec recognize and honor all Native histories, literature, and community. We encourage all of you joining us tonight to learn more about land acknowledgments and the rightful owners of the land where you are viewing tonight's event. A good place to start is native-land.ca. After being closed for most of the 2020, Women and Children Thirst here in Chicago is now open uh, at limited capacity for in-store browsing. We also offer curbside pickup and we ship anywhere in the United States. Um, a few little notes. Be sure to drop your questions for Diane and Carolyn in the ask a question box at the bottom of the screen. You can also buy the seed creeper by clicking that handy button at the bottom of the screen that says buy the book. Diane Wilson is the author of the memoir Spirit Car Journey to a Dakota Past, which won a Minnesota Book Award and was selected for the One Book, One Read Minyak. I'm sorry, one read program. She is also the author of Beloved Child, A Dakota Way of Life, which was awarded the Barbara Sedler Award for History. Her most recent essay, Suits for Seven Generations, was featured in the anthology of Good Time for the Truth. Wilson is the executive director for the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, which is a national coalition of tribes and organizations working to create sovereign food systems for Native people. She is a Midwakan descendant, enrolled of the Rosebud Reservation, and lives in Schaefer, Minnesota. Carolyn Holbrook is a writer, educator, and longtime advocate for the healing power of the arts. Her essay collection, Tell Me Your Names, and I Will Testify, is a finalist for the 2021 Minnesota Book Award in the memoir nonfiction category. She is also the co-author of the Minnesota Civil Rights icon, Dr. Josie R. Johnson's memoir, Hope in the Struggle. She teaches creative writing at the Loft Literary Center and other community venues. Um, and at Hanlon University, where she won the Exemplary Teacher Award of 2014. I'm so, so excited for tonight's event. Um, and so please join me in welcoming Carolyn Holbrook and Diane Wilson. Amatakiapi. Diane Wilson, Amakiapi, Bidewakan Tuan Oyate, Hamatahaya, Sichangu Oyate. Ed Omawapia. Hello, all my relatives. It's really good to be here tonight. My name's Diane Wilson. I am a descendant of the Bidewakantuan Oyate, and I am enrolled on the Rosebud Reservation. And I really want to thank Sarah and the Women and Children First Bookstore. Welcome back, Carolyn. <laughs> um, I'm just thanking Sarah and this awesome bookstore. It is such an honor to be here tonight. And um, I'm really happy to show support for this really important mission. Um, you, you say it all in the title of your bookstore. 
I'm also really happy to be reading with my dear friend and writing buddy, Carolyn Holbrook. We have known each other over, well, you know, say 30 years, um, dating back to the time when we were both uh, executive director for different nonprofits and we've supported each other through boards. And then we became writing buddies and now we call each other our book doulas. So um, we've helped birth a number of books with each other. So tonight, um, Carolyn and I are both, we'll both be talking about our new books. Um, we'll talk and read from them for about 15 minutes each. And then we would like to have a chat about the challenges that women writers face as we care for our families and our communities and our responsibility to share knowledge with an upcoming generation of new writers. And after that, we'll ask all of you to join in the conversation and, or, or ask questions. Um, there is a button, evidently, that, um, that works. <laughs> so, um, Carolyn, did you want to say anything before I launch into? I think you're muted. I just want to echo. No, I just I just unmuted, I think. Can you hear me now? I thought I just unmuted. Okay. Um, I just want to echo what you said. I think we're really grateful to be able to participate in this event at Women and Children um, first. Uh, you do have an awesome mission and really proud to be here with my buddy, Diane. So um, hopefully you guys will enjoy our evening together. I'm gonna talk now about um, The Seed Keeper and I'm gonna show you, actually, it got a um, new cover on it because the first cover was, was as beautiful as it was. Um, the black was actually trapping some of this, what is real beadwork created by Holly Young. So uh, I love both, but I especially love this second one. So I wanna tell you um, a little bit about the background to The Seed Keeper. It's, um, it's a novel, but it was inspired by a true story that I first heard back in 2002 when I participated in the Dakota Commemorative March to honor the 1,700 Dakota women and children who were removed from Minnesota after the 1862 Dakota War. Um, and at that time, uh, they had no idea where they were being sent or how they would feed their families. So they sowed their seeds from their gardens into the hems of their skirts and they hid them in their pockets. So even when families were starving, the, the, the women protected their seeds for the coming season and for future generations. So thanks to their courage and their sacrifice, they, those women are the reason why we have Dakota corn today and why I am able to grow it in my own garden. So while I was working on this book, um, I, was, I was blessed to also work with a number of elders um, who taught me that our seeds are our ancestors, that they are our relatives, and that they are sacred beings. I also learned that our food is medicine and that if you can control the, the food, you can control the people. But for me as a writer, I have to say, it was really challenging how to figure out how to combine the stories and the history and what I was learning into a book. It took me about 10 years to write it. And so tonight I'm very relieved <laughs> and very happy to finally share The Seed Keeper with the world. <laughs> And so the book is told through the voices of four Dakota women across several generations um, from 1862 to 2002. And the seeds themselves open the book with a poem that reminds us of our ancient agreement to take care of them in exchange for the gift of food. So the story begins with the main character, Rosalie Ironwing, who is about to leave the farm where she's lived for 22 years to return to her childhood home on a Dakota reservation. After her father died when she was 12, she grew up in foster care, believing that she had no family 
And at this time of her life, Rosalie had no connection to seeds at all. When she marries a white farmer and learns to garden, she starts the journey that will ultimately reconnect her to her family, their legacy of seeds, and her community. So I'm going to read two short excerpts. And in the first one, we'll meet Marie Blackbird, who is Rosalie's great-great-grandmother, who was 14 during the 1862 Dakota War. And in this, uh, in this piece, it is the night before the soldiers are coming to take them away. And Marie and her mother are about to open their cash pit of seeds where they store their food um, for, for the next season. Ina leaned the cradle board against the trunk of a nearby tree. She squeezed through the neck of the pit loosing a layer of soil from the walls as she dropped to her feet, her head just visible above the lip. Using her hands as her eyes, she felt all around her, her fingers recalling the corn they had shelled, the squash they had sliced thin with her knife. She lifted a bag of corn to me, followed by a smaller bag of beans. She searched the walls until she found a packet of squash seeds. Grasping her hand, I helped her climb gingerly out of the pit until she lay on the ground, breathing hard. Marie, do you remember how we covered the pit last fall, she asked, still trying to catch her breath. Huh, Ina, do it now while I feed your brother. I laid the sticks back across the opening, covered them with the deer hide, added a layer of soil, and buried everything in a thick pile of leaves. When my mother nodded her approval, I rolled the large stone back on top. Ina scattered a pinch of chanshasha across the leaves and whispered a quick prayer asking for the seed's protection, for their safety. As we turned to leave, Ina stopped and pulled the bone hole from her sack. Her fingers tenderly brushed the coarse edge of the bison scapula before she passed it to me. This belonged to my mother. It's all she would use. She said that the Washichu steel tools scar the earth. We cannot carry it with us. Bury it with the seeds, not too deep. Be quick. That night, Ina showed me how to sow rows of seeds into our skirts along the edge of our blankets in the hem of Chasquet's warm baby dress. My fingers trembled from cold and hunger as I sewed quick, uneven stitches along my skirt, folding the fabric over a double row of corn, seeds that were blue, rose, and cream, wamanaheza, the corn for our traditional soup. My mother was afraid the soldiers would take everything of value left to us. She knew, too, that if the food ran out, these seeds would have to be hidden from her own people, who would be desperate to feed their children. She had to keep safe enough seeds for planting, no matter the cost. I tied a double knot at the end of my thread and cut it with a quick slice of my knife. We worked long into the night. I would have fallen asleep early on, but Ina said we could not take time to rest. She showed me how to quickly stitch a small deerskin pouch and fill it with corn from her sack making a second pouch for the beans. She placed each pouch inside a willow basket that I would carry. Ina would have Chaske on her back in his cradle board, and the rest of the food hung in sacks around her neck. From a beaded pouch she kept near her sleeping place, Ina unwrapped a small object with great care. Taking my hand, she placed a wrinkled cob with faded blood-red seeds on my palm. This was a gift from your grandmother, your kunshi, who gave me these seeds when I married. You must keep them safe. Ina rewrapped the little cob and placed the pouch around my neck where it lay heavy on my thin chest. I understood, even at my young age, the responsibility that my mother had just shared with me. No matter what happened, I must be strong enough to protect this pouch and the willow basket I would carry in the morning. With no men to hunt for us, 
forced to leave behind the medicine plants we had relied on for generations, we would have only these seeds to help us survive. When I finally went to bed, I did so fully dressed, still wearing my moccasins, and waited for the sun to reveal the new life that lay ahead. So from there, the book moves around in time, telling the story <clears throat> from different perspectives, alternating between Rosalie and the voices of her best friend, Gabby Makespeace, her great aunt, Darlene Killsdeer, and Marie Blackbird, who is her great-great-grandmother. And as we follow the lives of these women, we're also following the story of the seeds themselves until one day they disappear. And so over the course of the, the lives of these four women, we also see the challenges they go through, um, especially Marie Blackbird as, after the war when she's, her family is then moved to South Dakota and the family keeps moving and ultimately um, one generation goes through boarding schools. And so you see the challenges that change how their, um, their relationship to the seeds and to the land until finally we get to Rosalie, who grows up without any connection to these seeds that her uh, great-great-grandmother had so carefully protected. And so this, um, this last excerpt that I'm going to read is from 1998. So, hmm, so okay, that's, uh, what, 150-ish years after um, Marie's um, uh, excerpt. And so this is a conversation between Rosalie and her teenage son, Tommy. And the year in 1998, it's just two years after GMO seeds were first publicly released. And while I don't, um, I don't make a big political statement about GMO seeds in this book, I do use them to tell the story of how our relationship with seeds has evolved. A few months before the first shipment of seeds was due to be delivered, <clears throat> I knocked on the door of Tommy's room. He was a young man now and kept it closed all the time. His deep voice cracked as he called out for me to enter. Inside, clothes were strewn in untidy heaps a math book was open on his desk, and he sat playing his favorite video game. He looked at me with curiosity. So seldom did I come to his room except to put away laundry. What's up? Tommy, your father listens to you. If you tell him not to use these seeds, he'll pay attention. Why would I do that? I told him my fears. Then I added an argument that I hoped would spark a memory of what he had learned as a boy. It's not right what they've done to these plants. It's not right to take life apart like that just because it will make you money. You remember when you were younger and we talked about how the corn feeds the little voles who become food for the hawks. How the sandhill cranes eat the leftover seeds when they stop here to rest during their fall migration. Even the crows rely on field corn to survive. What happens to the birds when they eat these seeds? What happens to us? Nothing, Mom. Nothing is going to happen to the birds or to you and me and Dad, except that, for once, we'll make some good money. Even you can't argue with that. After that conversation, I barely listened when Tommy and John talked about the farm. I didn't want to give up not when the Minnesota River was already one of the most polluted in the country. But I wondered if there was a different way for me to do this work. I had tried to be like Gabby, who used her skills as a lawyer to fight threats to the river and the land. Maybe it wasn't my way to fight from anger. Maybe I needed to learn how to protect what I loved instead. For now, at least, that left me with my garden. I poured my time and energy into caring for her, feeding the soil with the manure I spread with a shovel, watering the plants by hand. Some days I sang to them, serving up a mix of my father's old powwow songs. 
A library book showed me that the tiny seeds I had taken for granted were actually unique living beings with their own history, story, and family. Each seed was made of an embryo, a seed coat, and something nutritious, almost like a packed lunch. The mother plant, like me, wanted only the best for her babies. Some plants, like dandelions, scattered their seeds in the wind, while others, like some pines, needed fire to open their cones. Somehow, the mother knew to dry her seeds almost completely so they would sleep until the time was right to wake. Each seed held a trace of life that would spark when given water, when given the appropriate conditions. Everywhere I looked, I saw how seeds were holding the world together. They planted forests, covered meadows with wildflowers, sprouted in the cracks of sidewalks, or lay dormant until the long-awaited moment came, signaled by fire or rain or warmth. They filled the produce aisle in grocery stores. Seeds breathed and spoke in a language all their own. Each one was a miniature time capsule, capturing years of stories in its tender flesh. How ignorant I felt compared to the brilliance contained in a single seed. I had begun to see that when we save these seeds, when we select which ones will be planted again, our lives become braided into the life stories of these plants. So the question that I'm asking throughout the Seed Keeper is all about our relationship with seeds and the ways in which that relationship has changed over many generations from that original agreement we had with the seeds where they offered us the, the gift of food in exchange for our care for them. And so I ask, what does that change mean for us as human beings? Um, one of my favorite um, quotes is from a Dakota activist and scholar, Harley Eagle, who asked, how do we fall back in love with the earth and with our seeds? And so the thought I want to leave you with is a, is a Dakota saying, which is mitakuye owasi, we are all related. So to me, we do this work by remembering that saying, we're all relatives. And we do it by honoring the sacrifices of our ancestors who protected those seeds for future generations. So Pidamaya, um, for listening to my story and sharing this, sharing the, this work with me. Um, it's my great pleasure now to turn this over to Carolyn Holbrook, who is going to share her book with us and tell us um, and do some reading and then I'll come back on and we'll share um, a conversation. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for coming again. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My book, Tell Me Your Names and I Will Testify, is a memoir um, that's written in connected essays. Um, this is because the essays were written over a, a lengthy period of time, beginning in the 80s, when my five children were in their teens. And uh, the book discusses a variety of themes, such as my career as a literary arts administrator, building my career while raising five children as a divorced single mom, um, my struggles with depression and racism that is hidden under what's known as Minnesota nice. Um, I begin the book <clears throat> with a section of a poem by the great Lucille Clifton in which she is visiting a cemetery on a plantation in South Carolina. I'm just going to read that section that I quote in my book. At the cemetery, Walnut Grove Plantation, South Carolina, 1989, Lucille Clifton. Nobody mentions slaves. And yet the curious tools shine with your fingerprints. Nobody mentioned slaves, but somebody did this work. 
who had no guide, no stone, who molders under rock. Tell me your names. Tell me your bashful names and I will testify. From there, I move to the prologue where I tell the story of a visit from an ancestor who commands me to tell our story. I took that to mean my family's story, but it could also mean for me to testify on behalf of my people, myself, my ancestors, my children, and certain aspects of the story of my people. So I'm going to read tonight from an excerpt from, from one of the uh, essays titled Stones and Sticks. Um, I feel that through, through telling parts of my story, I, I'm attempting to you know, join others in the conversation about deep and lasting humanity of my people. And I had my daughters and my granddaughters in mind throughout much of the writing of several of the essays, particularly this one called Stones and Sticks. Okay. There are turning points in everyone's life, though we sometimes fail to recognize them right away. I experienced one of those moments many years ago during a springtime poetry class where students were learning to make video poems. A young woman whom I will call Gretel wrote a poem about roller skating through a graveyard. Everyone in the class was intrigued by the idea and there was plenty of nervous laughter as class members threw words like spooky, macabre, and eerie around the room as we discuss visual shots that might work well for Gretel's poem. At the end of the evening, we agreed to meet that Sunday morning at the entrance of Lakewood Cemetery, where many prominent Minnesotans are buried. From the moment the decision was made, I felt disturbed, unable to come to grips with the thought that I might be complicit in the group's violation of the spirits of the deceased who lay peacefully in their graves. What right did we have to disturb them? just because a callow young woman wanted to see herself on videotape skating through their resting place. And what about the mourners scattered throughout the cemetery? How would they feel when Gretel skated by with the rest of us walking closely behind her, gawking while they prayed for their lost loved ones or placed flowers on their graves? Soon Gretel took us down a narrow pathway which led to a thick cluster of trees bordered with pink, purple, and white flowers. She stopped and turned to face the group. Then something, uh, she said something was in there that was really interesting. She spun around and began skating slowly down the path, glancing back to make sure we were following. I was the first to see the lovely weather-beaten statue of a woman who looked like she had been carved and a sculpt by a sculptor in the Greco-Roman era. Her figure was draped in a gown, belted at the waist, allowing her skirt to fall gently over the pedestal on which she stood. Her right hand rested serenely over her heart, and her left arm reached out in a gesture of peace. Her chiseled face was framed by long hair pulled back in a bun, and she gazed down at me with a soft smile. Her eyes, though devoid of color, appeared kind, she looked so real that it was hard to believe she was made of stone. The class stood in a semicircle and watched Gretel's eyes take on a ghoulish sparkle. The instructor trained the camera on her and an impish grin sped, spread slowly over her face. She spun around and skated up to the statue. She lifted her arms and stuck her finger in, stuck out her finger in a gesture that reminded me of Michelangelo's creation of Adam painting from the Sistine Chapel. God's finger almost touching the finger of man. Then she suddenly, uh, as suddenly as she lifted her arm, she snatched it back and she said, it's a statue of a black woman. If you touch her, you die. Then as though propelled by a tornadic wind, she skated away, leaving petals of laughter ringing in the air along with echoes of her words. I took another look at that woman locked in that dark body made of granite. And in my mind's eye, her shoulders began to slump from carrying the weight of all those, of all that stone. She seemed to almost crumble under the burden of underwork and underappreciation from cooking and cleaning 
for the families of Gretel's ancestors while desperately trying to care for her family, the families of my ancestors. I have three beautiful, intelligent daughters. I've had to help them maintain their self images over and over again, even as I've attempted to heal my own. I also fully understand the horror of what is happening to our young men. I have a son who was incarcerated for 10 years in the federal penitentiary, but there seems to be a conspiracy of silence around our girls and women. Could it be that in large part, our incarceration is invisible? That we are locked up in our bodies? Like countless black mothers, I have worked hard to train my daughters to be proud of who they are in a world that would have that would have them be ashamed of their darkness. For black women, loving ourselves and passing that self-love down to our daughters and our granddaughters is a difficult task. Centuries of negation often makes us feel like we need to adopt a hard protective shell, which is either praised as strength or dismissed as hostility. In short, we turn ourselves into stone. I left this, the cemetery wondering what it would take to liberate us. Today, as I think about what my parents had to go through, much that I didn't learn about until after they passed away, and the stories my students are carrying, I worry as I see my grandchildren move through a world where the past president gave the green light to white supremacy following President Barack Obama's eight years of hope, where black and brown people are under violent attack. I have to ask, what is it that will set us free? And I will stop there um, and just say again that the purpose of my book I, is, is to continue carry on the conversation that many are having with, um, you know, about the issues of, of race and what's been happening, you know, to our people, especially, um, I should say newly over the last four years after the last 401 years of, of um, what some people call COVID-1619, you know, that we were brought here as slaves in 1619 and the um, negation has not let up. And I, um, I'm feeling a sense of hope now though. And just, you know, knowing that it won't be easy, but feeling that you know, things are potentially um, turning around slowly, I hope. And that's where I'll stop. Thank you, Carolyn. Such a beautiful piece. So now we wanted to um, share a conversation and with each other, one that we actually talk about quite a bit. Um, and then to ask to ask all of you at um, at some point to, to join in with us or to ask your own questions. Um, but something that Carolyn and I talk a lot about is the, you know, it's this challenge for us as women balancing all that we do between family and our commitment to um, organizations that we work for and then also trying to stay true to our work as as writers as as artists um and so it's a tricky balance and i'm sure this is shared by by everyone out there whatever those pieces are that you're balancing but but how is it that that you can we can continue to take care of our communities and then also take care of ourselves and our work and and we and then on top of that we're at an age, we are older writers. What is our responsibility at this point? It's shifting. So these are things that we talk about. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Carolyn to um, talk, a, talk a little bit about your community work and then what's, what's important to you at this stage of your career? Yeah, um, that's such a great question. And, and as Diane said, it is something we've been talking about quite a lot lately. In fact, over the last 20 years at different <laughs> stages of our lives. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, my life has been, um, you know, I have, I have five children and um, 
you know, when I divorced my co-parent, um, it just didn't go easy. It was just very, very difficult. And I wanted to, I've always wanted to be a writer and I didn't know, um, you know, where to take classes or how to take classes when my children were little. Um, I couldn't focus on university classes. It was just too much with the children. And the classes at uh, certain community organizations were too expensive. So I just created a space of my own at the community center where my kids played. And um, I was able to develop a program that was pretty amazing. Um, and I was able, of course, to take creative writing classes free. <laughs> and I went from there to um, becoming the first black program director at the Loft Literary Center where I stayed for five years. And that was very, very difficult. And I left uh, and started another organization called Sassy, um, as an SASC self-addressed stamped envelope, but we called it Sassy for the purpose of, um, you know, just opening up the door for other people, like doors had been opened for me by the director of the park that um, where the first organization I had was. And, you know, I, I brought my kids along. I also had uh, a home-based secretarial service so that I could teach my kids to type, could teach them to proofread, teach them that their life did not have to, um, you know, continue in the poverty that we were living in. But it was also important for my children to focus on the community as well as our own, you know, little community in our home. Um, today, I'm still teaching. Um, I did, you know, eventually go back to school. Um, I'm still teaching today, but I also have another organization. I just can't stop doing this community stuff. It's just so important that that I reach out and that I make things possible for other people in my communities um, to, you know, to, to be able to, um, to see that it is possible for them to do whatever is important to them. And in this organization that I have now called More Than a Single Story, um, we have panel discussions and writing workshops that are um, uh, cross-cultural. Diane has been on several of them. And um, we just discuss topics that are meaningful and important to us. And a couple of my kids are involved. And one is, uh, is doing um, marketing, digital marketing, because she, you know, when she went to college, that's what she studied. And so she's working full time somewhere else. But, you know, she can't, she can't stop working with her grandma, which I'm happy about. <laughs> and it's just where I am today is um, just trying to do all I can to help the next generation, um, you know, through the difficult times that we've been through to, um, to know that they are valued, that they are valuable, that they mean something, that their lives matter. And, you know, helping them to also, you know, connect with the, the people in my generation who are here for them, to help them, you know, get on with the beautiful things in their lives. I hope that made sense. Um, yeah. And Diane, I want to throw the same question back to you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, you know, I, the, I guess the road I've taken has, has been really working through nonprofits in community. And in, in the past 15 years has been working for two uh, native-led organizations working in food sovereignty. And it's really, um, it became really challenging to be the director of organizations that are small and constantly struggling for survival and still trying to do creative work. But the thing is, I, I learned so much in those organizations. They, uh, the they gave me such a deep understanding of this work that I could then bring back to the writing, even though I wasn't able to squeeze out a book, uh, except for about every 10 years or so. But the fact that I knew firsthand what it meant to be in community 
um, working on these issues and then to turn that that knowledge back into a book and then have the book feed back into what I was doing and it was it was good but it was a you know a, a real challenge to keep those pieces together but I always said to myself I'm not a teacher you know I have the highest respect for people like Carolyn and everyone else out there who is able to to mentor and work with students and give them that gift of knowledge that helps them move forward in their lives and so but then you know it was probably five maybe five or six years ago when I was um I was at the that the uh the ride the Dakota ride down um I think we were preparing breakfast for the group that was coming through Lower Sioux. And, and I was introduced to an elder who had come down from Canada. And as he shook each person's hand, he asked each one of us, he said, are you a teacher? And I just thought, oh, you know, he's just asking us, what do we do for our work? And, you know, and I said, no, well, you know, <laughs> but it really, it stayed with me. The fact that he was asking each one of us, are you a teacher? And I, and, and so I had to, I had to, I had to think about that story for a long time and, and think about it in the context of the age that I was becoming, that as I, I'm leaving uh, nonprofit work in the not too distant future. This is work. This is younger person's work now, and that I do have a role to serve as a teacher um, to the best of my ability to help share the knowledge that I gained in writing these books and doing this work in nonprofit and pass that work on. You know, and even though I can constantly second guess myself, I feel like. Okay, I've so I've been working with a group of young writers, mentoring them, and I I I don't do it from that place of knowing writing from an academic perspective, but I can do it from a place of I know what it means to really care about a story and then to learn what you need to learn in order to make it into a book. So that's where Carolyn and I have really <laughs> shared a lot over the years um, in in both the work that we've tried to do in community, but then also being just as committed to wanting to create these books to, to the work of literature. And, and that's where, Carolyn, you mentioned something to me the other day about taking care of ourselves first. You know, it's like in the airplane. Do you wanna, you wanna add to that? Yeah, because as women, um you know, in, in our generation anyway, well, we have been taught that, you know, everyone else comes first and we forget or we, or we just don't realize that, you know, if we are not healthy, we can't serve the people that we love as well as we can if we are healthy. So we have to take care of ourselves. And it's a good thing to take care of, of, of yourself um, while you're doing this work in the community, while you're writing, while you're taking care of the people in your lives. Um, I want to go back to to the writing piece um, because, you know, I did get sort of, um, hmm, how do I want to say this, hooked on the nonprofit stuff and my writing sort of took a, a I don't want to say a backseat, took the, went to the side burner. And I just want to caution anyone who's doing um, art um, and also doing work in nonprofits or whatever uh, organization you're doing to be really cautious about that you know if, if you your art is is who you are every the, the other stuff is too but don't let your art don't yeah don't let the rest of that of, of it you know get in the way of you creating the things that you need to create to pass on to other people Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's a that's a tricky question because that's the one where i think going back you know the point at which it became difficult was when you become the director for an organization and you hold so mm -hmm. much responsibility but at the same time when there there is such deep need in our communities 
um, and there's and there's a deep need for for people to take on leadership of organizations. You know, it's a very hard place to put your own writing first when the need is so great. And it's just important. I'm realizing more and more. Um, I have been realizing this for some time. It's just as important for <clears throat> excuse me for our people to be connected to story because it's so healing and the stories that, um, that we're both telling um, are, are really there to, you know, to, to help people, you know, learn about their, their past. The, I mean, not just the, the, the stuff that you find in, um, you know, social service books or sociology books or whatever, but those stories from the people themselves are just so important and encouraging for others to tell their own stories that are just as powerful and important. Where, Oops, you're muted. Where, what, there you go. Okay. Um, that's where. <laughs> oh, are we getting some mm -hmm. feedback? Um, the the last conference that I went to was right before uh, the pandemic shut everything down, and it was um, hosted by the Lower Phelan Creek. Um, nonprofit, and uh, they it was it was titled "We're still we are still here," and I went. I was especially interested in hearing what Crystal Echohawk had to say. She'd done all this uh, huge research um, into the um, into na different Native communities to come up with kind of an assessment for what are the the biggest challenges facing Native communities today, and she said. Across the board, one of the biggest issues is invisibility. And and right there, Carolyn, what you're saying about stories, and to me, that's what it meant, that that all this, you know, for so many hundred years now, there have been other interpretations of Native stories from people outside the culture. And that at the same time, um, people going through boarding school have been silenced and um, a lot of uh, people have lost that that connection to to their own culture. And so it seemed to me in that in thinking about that more too, that the the work that we do is um, to sum it up the way Crystal Echohawk put it, change the if you want to change the future, change the story. And so the work that we do now, the work that we can do um, in in uplifting writers, in helping to raise these stories up, um, I think is that next, it is that next phase of our lives in our work where we can help um, share the skills that we've that we've that we have as writers, but also you know, that life experience that, that you gain from being part of these organizations and then and what it means to actually take on a leadership role and um, and build an organization and then turn it over to somebody else. It it's these are skills that we can pass on, but but the, it, that deeply important work of raising up our stories um, is, I think, where we're both focusing now. Um, and I see we have a question that I would okay. like to, um, did you have anything more you wanted to say, Carolyn? Otherwise I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna read this question out loud. Um, yeah, let's so, do that. And I wanna, I wanna just invite all of you to put your thoughts in the question and answer and share your experience about how you balance things in your life and and how you, you know, just how, how you're carrying your own work forward. Um, so this is from Alicia, who says, so excited for these books, having lived on the Pine Ridge Res, I feel like I've seen so much beauty there and so much pain that is passed down. What are your thoughts on the role of art and literature in bringing light to this generational pain while also showing the present beauty? Oh, that's it, isn't it? The work of literature. Um, yeah. I think, boy, that is, that Alicia is the big challenge as writers to not 
you know, it's like we have to we have to have enough context in there to understand what this story means because I found it to be really helpful in in describing or sharing the um, the context of what's happened so that it it alleviates some of the shame that people feel about where they're at in their own lives. You have to know where we came from and what was done, what the government did. But but I really don't want to keep the conversational focus there because then it still becomes all about what um, uh, dominant society, what government assimilation policies did to Native people. And instead, shift, once we have that contextual understanding, shift to that beauty and brilliance that is Native cultures. And so to me, it's a tricky balance, but let's celebrate. Um, we, in fact, this past week, we had seed week. I'll make this quick, Carolyn. <laughs> but it was the, the whole idea was let's celebrate the incredible um, accomplishments and, and cultural importance of these traditions. And, you know, there was, there's just so much genius in, in um, Native culture and that I really focus on food issues and Native people uh, have been brilliant agriculturalists for thousands of years. And yet who knows that? Who knows that the foods we eat are largely because of the work that Native uh, agriculturalists did. So anyways, uh, that to me is the, that's the storytelling challenge right there. How do you bring in the story, but never lose sight really of that, the, the beauty. And that's, that to me is, that's literature. That's where the language itself can be beautiful. And that um, even when you're, even when you're telling a painful story, you can craft it in a way that is still, still contains that beauty. Over to you, Carolyn. Okay. I just wanted to share a moment that happened during my book launch in August. Um, I had, I, I think I, I read, I read two excerpts from different essays and a question from the audience was how can a woman asked, how could she um, as a single mother write about her life without, um, you know, talking about the pain and the suffering that she had experienced. And, you know, my response was, she she has to go there. She has to talk about that. She has to allow herself to, you know, get through that there's so much shame involved in being poor and the things that have happened to you. And we shouldn't be ashamed of those things. They happened to us. They didn't happen, you know, as, a, um, you know, we often did not cause the pain, but we are struggling with that pain. So, um, yeah, it's just so important for us to be able to, um, you know, to tell our stories. And then also, um, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to say about that. Looks like there's another question there, too. There's another question. Um, Kelsey says, I love your writing partnership. Could you each share a moment of joy you witnessed in the other's writing process, especially when working on your most recent books? Mm. I'll share one for nice. Carolyn's book. Um, you know, we, as I said in our introduction, we are each other's book doula, which means we go all the way from conception to, you know, this, it is a long process to get a book done especially you know you have lives so so carolyn's book was many years in the making and um and so to go through that process with her see that determination to get it done to stay with it no matter what um and then uh to, to so what was it two months ago when her book was nominated as a finalist for the Minnesota Book Awards. <laughs> Woohoo! You know, I got to I got to celebrate with her and and just appreciate all that went into bringing that that beautiful book to to the world. So yeah, that was that was my happy happy moment. I've had so many joyful moments in my relationship with Diane. Um, 
and one that stays with me a lot is when we first met, because I was trying to recruit her to join my board, my nonprofit board, right? <laughs> and we somehow started talking about our lives. And she told me, you know, stories. And they were like, Diane, come on, man, we gotta write these. We gotta get these stories written. And just being able to watch this and to um, work with her while um, while we've both gone through this writing process and completing books. Her, she has more books than I do at this point, but seeing her books also win prizes and the um, her memoir, Spirit Car, Journey from a D Dakota Past, when it became um, adopted by the Duluth, Minnesota school system was a moment for me because they decided that Kill a Mockingbird is dead and gone, old news. They need to deal with something that's current, present, and also historical for the many, many Native people that live in that area. And for me, that was such an, a thrilling moment to hear that her book had been adopted by you know, in that way. Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. That, that became kind of an exciting moment for other reasons. <laughs> because yeah, not right. everyone in, in Duluth was happy about that choice. So it right. actually, it was one of those moments where um, letters were written to the school board and people were protesting the change and they didn't want Spirit Car. They, you know, it, so it became, it became a whole big thing. And mm -hmm. And um, and then they got I well the the curriculum department in the middle of all that wrote to me and said would you be willing to come up and talk to students and I thought oh hell no you know you've got you've got your you've got your everyone's in uproar right now but so I wrote her back I said you know with without the teacher support I wouldn't come speak to the students but I will come talk to the to the teachers. So we eventually arranged a meeting. Uh, I forget it was one of those um, days that teachers do enrichment days or something. And so I went in. Yeah. And I went in there with Jim Rock, who is just a just an amazing storyteller, wild man thinker. And um, and we 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 just shared stories. You know, it wasn't uh, we just talked about um dakota history dakota culture you know we told them some of the impact of what's happened but again going back to that first question we talked about the culture like you know jim talks a lot about star knowledge which to me is so fascinating and then we talked about here's the impact that you know that assimilation has had, especially on children, and then, you know, talk to them about ways in which they could talk to their students in addressing, you know, in teaching that book. So it was a huge, <laughs> it was high stress, but um, that's the work. That's the work we have to do, is bring those and stories I mean, I, I just want to... Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Speaking of what you were saying about Jim Rock, that's been just another amazing um, thing for me to watch is that um, over the 10 or so years that it took Diane to write this book, she was collecting knowledge and the knowledge is, is going into the book. And sometimes you're not even aware <laughs> of doing that. And then when I saw the father talking about star knowledge mm -hmm. and you were talking about Jim Rock, talking about I star was. knowledge. I was, yes. Yes. But, Jim Rock yeah, was. I mean, hey, mm -hmm. <laughs> he was Jim Rock himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was, um, so Alicia, I don't know if you're a writer. I did, I can't remember, but, um, you know, the ways in which you can layer those pieces into stories okay. that are about hard topics, but, you know, the, um, I tried to layer in Jim Rock <laughs> talking about star knowledge because I think of, of the many contributions Native people have made to this world, um, star knowledge is, is so significant. And then to show your characters, who, even though they're struggling with assimilation, um, there are there are paths back. There are ways back to reclaiming that knowledge and and so you know it's hard work but we we have to do it for the sake of our children and that's why 
I was so excited for us to come to this this bookstore tonight because it is it's all about the children, you know. And I think Carolyn and I, between raising our families and um, the work that we do, we've we you you just through your life and your work and your writing and everything else, you just try to you just try to make a better way of life for your children. And if and even sometimes if it's not your own children, it can be just children. So the people, the kids who come into your programs, who come into your lives, who, you know, you have the, the blessing of, of meeting, um, that's what it's for. So. Oh, and there's a question a from Cindy here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Cindy. Um, as women who are ah. superb multitaskers, planning for the future, <laughs> researching and mining the past, caring for your organizations and communities, how do you learn to treasure being fully in the moment with your families and yourselves? I feel like it's just sort of an automatic thing. We just do it, you know, and there's just being with family uh, is a treasure. And, you know, I started writing these little things um, when my kids were teenagers and I did it to keep myself sane as a, single parent whose co-parent wasn't very nice and you know i i kind of focused on the funny things that my kids said and did uh, in addition to all the crazy stuff that happens of ah, trying to raise five kids but there was always something really funny in some of the things they did just very beautiful moments that that i treasure to this day um yeah how would you answer that um you know, I have a garden. And so mm -hmm. if I can get away from everything else and be in the garden, then I can usually, then I'm fit to be with my family. <laughs> so, you know, you, it goes That's back funny. to what Carolyn said earlier. You have, you do have to take care of yourself. So if you're giving a lot to your organizations, to your, to your, you know, your families, everything else, you got to carve out those places. And hopefully you know, writing is one of the places because it gets you, you know, re you got to reconnect with your own spirit. You got to stay centered that way. And then, and then you have room and joy for the people in your life. Yes. So then that there's another question, Carolyn, about what are you reading right now? <laughs> I am reading Claudia Rankin's new book, Just Us. Mm. Um, where she's sort of dissecting questions that come up or things that she's thinking about um, in terms of black and white relationships. And um, how can I even explain what Claudia Rankin does? It's so amazing. Um, <laughs> there's, I just finished a section where she's asking white men what they think about race relations and she gets into some really interesting stuff there. So, um, yeah, that, that's what I'm reading now. Um, I just finished a book called Sharks in the Time of Saviors by Kawhi Strong Washburn. And that was a phenomenal book. It's a novel um, about Hawaii. And I just, I really enjoyed that book. So just finished it about to move on to a stack of books that, well, I, right, I, stopped, by, stack. I stopped by Birch Bark Books and came out with a stack. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I hope you're all gonna yeah. make it into women and children first sometime soon now that they're open and get your own stack of real books. Mm -hmm. Oh. I've also just you know so what? long ago finished reading what? It's uh, it's a little after eight, I think. I, oh, <laughs> I'm so. I think we've just gone over. Um, so um, maybe we have to. Maybe we have to. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. We were just having too much fun. <laughs> Thank you both so much. That was such a wonderful conversation, and it's so. 
so rare to hear two women talk about how integrated their writing, their creative life is with their organizational life, with their family and personal life. We're usually so siloed when we talk about these things. So I really appreciate how you braided it all, all together in your conversation. Thank you all so much for coming. This was such a delightful evening. Um, I hope that you will consider buying the book tonight or some of the other books that we put in the chat, um, including a link to buy Carolyn's incredible book as well, which is available now on our shelves. Or you can just stop by Women and Children First. We're now open noon to six if you're in Chicago. Thank you both so, so much. Mm -hmm. This event was recorded, so anyone who didn't um, watch it can watch it anytime, forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can watch it here um, on Crabcast and share it with those who missed, missed it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Have a wonderful night. Okay.